mycology. So today we will talk about fungal classification, structure and replication and uh, there are many interesting things about uh, mycology and one of the difficult infections to treat let alone uh, to diagnose but recently uh, especially for physicians who are there for diagnosis they've been encouraged when they look at infectious diseases they look at some of the skin lesions they are trained and they are advised to think green that's what the message is to think green I know some of you like green color so there you go green over here okay think green not that all the fungi look green but that's one of the important things especially plants so initially we used to think that uh, they look like plants and uh, Many of the pictures that I present, you can see copyrighted by Dennis Kunkel. Uh, and one of the person who did individual pocket, uh, project that was posted on the YouTube, and he told me, or she told me, I don't remember, that uh, she called up Dennis Kunkel to take permission from him because the person spent a lot of time on that. They're copyrighted. So we have to do due, due acknowledge acknowledgement to these people and he allowed that only for our class at that particular time. So keep in mind that especially for pictures and things of that nature, especially scientific, they are not a license for you to freely disseminate them. So you have to be careful. One of the things that I would uh, try to encourage and uh, impress upon you is that fungi by all purposes look like beautiful plants, beautiful plants. And I want you, you to appreciate, like we did in viruses, that they sometimes look weird. And um, the, the colors didn't show up on the screen, but if you look at your own presentations, uh, they this look green, uh, red. So they are very symmetrical, very organized, and a very beautiful nature, like coral. So they are like flowery thing, and the color comes from there. But unfortunately, they also cause a lot of damage to us, and we are still struggling to figure out what do we need to do. So uh, fungi, they happen to be most beautiful structures in nature. So if you look at all these fungi on the right hand side, different forms and shape, colors, but I want you to understand and appreciate that they are one of the most complex structures. And remember, when a thing is complex, we have a problem. Our immune system has a problem, uh, therapy has a problem, treatment is a problem. So we are going through problems of antifungal drugs. They are multicellular, and as I said earlier, they are very colorful and very eye-catching to see, especially uh, in the nature. And many a time when you leave your uh, loaf of bread, uh, bread on the table, so fungi comes over here that not be that colorful, but it's going to be smelling awful as well. So there's a smell element for fermentation attached. So today I'm going to talk about these objectives. We'll talk about uh, the importance of fungi, uh, classes, taxonomy. I want you to know how would you differentiate between yeast and mold. How do they metabolize because we want to stop that metabolism. How do they reproduce and uh, what is it uh, among fungi that causes human disease. Now remember that everything is not bad per se. Um, if you look at ecology, look at the importance of fungi in nature, you will see they are ubiquitous, present everywhere. They are diverse group of organism. And in nature, they are there to decompose or degrade organic matter. So we want to get rid of organic matter and that's what they do and help us with. Now uh, they're heterotrophic existence, they are all heterotrophic existence and we do divide them into uh, different forms that you can see from here uh, as we've been discussing over and over again as well. Sap ropes are organisms that live on dead or decaying matter, fungi are one of them. Symbionts are organisms that live together in which they, they kind of associate with you for 
mutual advantage. So it's not like some of the bacteria, there's no advantage that you basically uh, are not in a give and take uh, relationship, but you basically are in an advantageous or opportunistic relationship. You take opportunity of the host. Commensals, again, we discussed that, uh, where we benefit from that relationship and uh, it could be harmed if such an opportunity arises for them to, uh, to invade you. And then we talked about parasites. And parasites basically, again, live on or within a host. And they derive benefit from you, but uh, they don't contribute anything in return. So in this case, this kind of parasitic relationship is, of course, harmful to the host. And we talked about uh, viruses, which are parasitic relationship. And uh, in this case also, you will see some of the fungi also fall into that category. The next question, again, for you is that if you have a fungal infection, is it good for you to give antibiotics? And how are you going to differentiate between fungi and bacteria? And this is one of the com common questions asked. So keep in mind, uh, fungi are eukaryotic. Who else is eukaryotic? Sorry? Animals, you yourself. Human beings are eukaryotic. Don't worry about the animals. You yourself are eukaryotic. So uh, prokaryotes are basically bacteria. If I tell you that fungi are eukaryotic, and I, what is the implication of that? What would you think in terms of uh, you know, uh, treatment, for example? Complicated, but what exactly is going on? Exactly. So if you're going to give an antifungal therapy, and they happen to be eukaryotic, so they will, of course, get rid of that particular fungi, but it will cause you damage as well, because you yourself are eukaryotic. So that's a challenge over here. They are, have ADS ribosome, they have mitochondria, they have ER, as compared to prokaryotic, with no nucleus, 70S ribosome, no mitochondria, and no ER, endoplasmic reticulum. So you can see that, uh, keep in mind, whether you give uh, ointments, oral, and one of the commonest uh, treatment over the counter, and I can also tell you, if you have never been prescribed an antifungal cream or antifungal tablets, they happen to be very expensive. And many time insurance doesn't cover that. So that's again, is a challenge for us. Now, if you look at uh, some of the important things that our immune system, again, immune system will come over and over again because immune system, your immune system, if it's normal, should be able to take care of any fungi that come in your way. But why did we notice more fungal infection in the last, last couple of decades? Because the problems we are having with AIDS patient, the problem we are having in terms of uh, transplant patient and problems we are having in terms of giving people steroids, okay? So that's something. The other important thing is that uh, fungi can also serve as opportunistic infections. So they may cause morbidity and mortality. What is the difference between morbidity and mortality? Morbidity is to make people sick and mortality is to kill them, as simple as that. So we do see an overall instance of specific invasive mycosis. And I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, mycosis basically mean uh, fungi which have this ability to invade you and go for your deeper tissues. So uh, also keep in mind when we talk of fungi, especially of that nature that cause problem to human beings, there is no such thing as non-pathogenic fungi. So if they happen to be human pathogens, they are always pathogenic. They will cause problem to you. Now, we all already tied up fungi with the AIDS for the good reason, because your immune system is compromised. And the AIDS patient or cancer patient or people taking chemotherapy, so these, there's a list of people that their immune system is challenged. So they stand a better chance for fungal infection. And you will see that happening many a times. 
as far as their taxonomy is concerned, structure and application is concerned, we classify them and put them in a big kingdom called fungi. And the study of fungi is mycology. So mycology, mysis, is something, it's a mycobacterium. So because initially they thought the way it grows look like mycelium. Uh, I told you they are eukaryotic and they basically are distinguished from other eukaryotic by a rigid cell wall. So there's something that still is good for us to know because even if they are eukaryotic, they have a structure that I'm going to discuss right now. The most important of that is ergosterol and that is substituted for cholesterol. So we mostly will have cholesterol and uh, their cell membrane will have ergosterol. So that will suggest to you that we do have a chance to come up with the antifungal therapy. If you look at the structure, a typical structure of a fungi, so you can see a nucleus and you'll see organelles there like mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, uh, ribosomes, and you will see endoplasmic reticulum. And then, of course, like us, they have a cell membrane. We don't have cell wall, but they have cell wall. That's why initially we used to think that maybe they're plants. So you will see over here that they have a cell wall, right? And as I said earlier, the most important thing for cell membrane is that ergosterol that replaces cholesterol. And the other important thing is that the cell wall, mannan, linked to surface protein, that's another important thing. And chitin and glucans, they basically give the rigidity to the cell. So you can see I already gave you three important structures for antifungal drugs to target. Cell wall mannan, and mannan, arabino mannan, was important for mycobacteria, if you remember. And then again, chitin and uh, glucan give the rigidity to cell wall, so they have the structure element. Okay, now uh, the capsule per se, if you look at the capsule that they have, it has a polysaccharide structure and then of course like any, any other capsule it is antiphagocytic and that also remains a virulence factor. Okay, and also remember that uh, this particular encapsulated yeast especially is a cryptococcus neoformans. So you have to remember that one of the fungi, cryptococcus neoformans, which is an en encapsulated yeast. So that's important thing for us to know in terms of the capsule that they carry. If you look at their cell wall, like any cell wall, it is antigenic in nature. And it has, we already discussed that it has multi-layer and most of them are polysaccharides, about 90%. And um, among polysaccharides, they are hexose and Hexosamine polymers, so these are important, especially when we go to target them. They do have proteins and glycoproteins, 10%. And then, of course, the function of cell wall, like any other cell wall, it gives, provides them shape, rigidity, strength, and protect them from osmotic shock. So these are some of the important things that uh, we have to keep in mind when we talk of cell wall of fungi. Now, uh, <clears throat> you can see from here, uh, we do think about the size of fungi, and we pretty much know what are the sizes of uh, bacteria, but of course, viruses are much, much smaller uh, than fungi. They, in no way, they are near to the size of a virus, because virus is very small. If you look at taxonomy, especially for fungi, most of the time we look at their morphology, we look, look at their ability to produce spores. But recently, uh, especially for your book purpose, I think, uh, and I'll agree with that, that uh, they divide that into unicellular and multicellular. So these are the two easier classification for you to remember. Okay? The most simple growing based upon morphology, they basically are lumped fungi, either they are, they are yeast or mold. I'm going to come back to what are the differences between a yeast and a mold. Another important thing, concept for fungi, I want you to keep in mind, we call dimorphic fungi. So dimorphic fungi are mostly, there are medical importance, and they exist in both 
yeast form and a mold form. So they have either a unicellular or multicellular and they call diamorphic uh, fungi. Let's talk of yeast first. So now yeast is basically a unicellular fungi and they reproduce by budding. So it's like you see like you know the typical sometimes you buy an old rotten potatoes and you see small little buds coming out of that. So they basically have a bigger structure we call mother and then some little tiny portion they kind of pinch off from there. So this is what we call daughter. So they again mother daughter kind of a thing. And this, uh, this kind of uh, structure that they have is then there will be a structure which will seem like a a bar so it will like an extent, extended bar so that's what sometimes we refer to hyphae and I'm going to talk about in a while but this type of elongation that you normally see from mother daughter spreading it may seem to you that they are like septate, like different portions, like you have these chairs, you know, in a septate form, they look alike and they are linked to each other, but in fact, they are not, so we call them pseudo. This means uh, contrary to the fact, pseudo high feet. So uh, it may seem to you that they are multicellular, but they are not. They still are unicellular. The appearance misleads you, so you tend to think that they are uh, multicellular, they are unicellular. And if you uh, look at them, for example, and you use yeast for flour, that's what you normally use, you know, for uh, you know, baking. So that exactly is the same. And you will see that they, they create that kind of a round pasty mucide, especially colonies if they were to grow on agar. So mold and yeast, these are the two major things that we define them, especially in terms of cells. So let's see. On the top, you can see uh, nuclear fission, a binary fission. You can see budding, and then you will see a typical structure we call the germ tube. So these are the three important uh, appearances that we normally see for a yeast. And then you can see the third one, that they basically are daughters coming from the mother, but they appear like a, a, a septate hyphae which is not true in sense and we call them pseudo hyphae. The other important thing I want you to keep in mind the terms for mycology, conidia. So this is like small little particles that shed off, conidia, we call them conidia. So they kind of shed off from there. If you look at the mold on the lower side, so mold again is a multicellular, okay? And then you can see the septate. So there is a clear part septum between different cells. So they are cells, multicellular, each one of them has a different nucleus. And then sometimes you can have more than one nuclei within the one cell. We call coencytic hyphae or we can have septic, septate hyphae, so one after another. And all of these are important because fungal infection cause skin infections. And then again, uh, you can also see that uh, sometimes we have hyphae with orthoconidia. And there's another term, orthoconidia, and I'm going to discuss that in a while, because many a times you acquire these fungi in terms of those small little particles, either be a conidia or they are basically orthoconidia. So they kind of spread out and you inhale them and they go into your system. But you see the major difference, unicellular and multicellular. Okay. <clears throat> For mold, they are multicellular. We talked about the hyphae, we talked about the, the coencytic, which basically are multinucleate appearance or they are septic. And then most of the time they form a structure which, which is like a mat-like structure, like exactly your rows of these chairs, one on top of each other. And they kind of closely net together, we call them mycelium. So mycelium. Okay. Now, uh, what is the difference between moles and yeast? That's what we just discussed. Yeast are single cell reproduced by budding. Moles have hyphae, which are filamentous, and they go by branching. So which one of these you think will kind of confuse you in terms of looking like plants more than the other? Moles, right? That's what you see growing on your rotten bread. So these are moles. 
they kind of look like these. If you look at those high feet, they like, it. and then if you blow at them, they're going to spread out. So they will go and disperse in environment, and then you will have to inhale them. Now, these are the examples of asexual spore formation. And you can see number on the top, a zygomycete and aspergillus. These are two fungi. I've given you an example that what I'm talking about in terms of you getting infected from fungi. So they're like this plant-like structure, especially if you see uh, zygomycetes on the top. And you will see that they have a typical structure. And they are small little structure hidden into sporangium. So these are like spores. It has those little tiny little dots. And when it breaks open, it's going to spread out in atmosphere, in the air. And then you either get it by touching or inhale. Or if it sticks onto fomites, you will get it. As compared to uh, conidia, which is over here, that happens in aspergillus. Then again, you have, again, conidia. This is like if you see like flowers, especially a flower with tiny little structures on the top of that. Looks like conidia. And then again, wind can blow them out. And then again, movement can blow them out, and they can also be there. So these are two of the important asexual reproduction and spore formation, especially for two important uh, fungi. I'm going to discuss that in detail, but you just keep remembering their names, zygomycete and aspergillus. So these are two important fungal infections that we'll discuss in detail. Of course, the next question comes, what's the difference between fungi and plant? Because it looked like plants. So what do you think, uh, what do you think the difference between uh, plants and fungi? Biology, right? I thought this was a prerequisite, right? Is biology a prerequisite? What is the major, major feature of plants? Sorry? Chloroplast. So plants have chloroplast, and what is the other important thing for the plants? Photosynthetic energy. So these are two important things that plants have. So uh, and fungi lack that. Fungi doesn't have a chloroplast, as you saw, and it doesn't have photosynthesis in terms of energy producing mechanisms. So that actually lies the clear difference between these two. Okay, is it clear? Yes. Okay. Now uh, fungi grow. And you, as I give you an example, that it grows on your rotten food, leftover food. And if you recall, all those things that form on molds. And also remember when we got penicillium mold growing when uh, Alexander, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. That's what it actually was, which was a fungi. So penicillin is coming from fungi. So that's a good use of uh, fungi in terms. So you can see that they can be filamentous, hairy, woolly. They come in different forms. And as, as I said earlier, some of them may have a, a aerial hyphae. In the previous picture, you saw those things jutting out, coming out, and having those small pores, spores that break apart and spread in environment. And this, especially when it happens in conidia, we call that an asexual reproductive element, especially if you know a little bit of plant biology. Exactly the same thing happens. Do you know of any plant, I mean, most of the plants have a male and female gametes, but do you know of any tree as such which will, which will have a male tree or a female tree? I know about plants because within plant biology, if you look at the flower, it has a uterus and they have all typical structures that we normally have in human beings. And then uh, two different gametes. Do you know of any tree, any plant that has a male tree or a female tree? No, okay, dates, that's what I think most of you like. Dates have a male tree and they have a female tree, so they really have to crossbreed. So there are many trees that are like that. But in fungi, basically, we most of the time have asexual reproduction. So that typical crossbreeding takes place, especially for the dates that you eat. Okay, so colony formation. So that's an important thing, and I think I gave you two important concepts. And uh, I will, you will appreciate, I told you sporangium, and I told you uh, conidia. In this case, you can see from here, uh, conidia may be produced by either budding, as you saw, or a thallic process where 
hyphal segment fragments into orthoconidia. So if you see the reproduction, that happens. And then it is airborne and disseminates the fungus. So if I was to ask you, what will be the route of entry for conidia or orthoconidia? So what will be the answer? How would you get infection from those fungi that are airborne? Respiratory system, right? Simple. So you have to inhale them. And they're very small and they will deposit in your uh, lungs. Now the other question we need to know because we want to stop fungal metabolism that they are aerobic. So they exhibit aerobic respiration but some of them may are facultatively anaerobic so they can also ferment as well. And some of them are strict anaerobes. So the question will be that uh, which of the following are the fungal metabol metabolic pathway number one aerobic respiration facultative anaerobic because they have to ferment and then finally some of them are strict anaerobes what are strict anaerobes they will die with oxygen so if you have they, they want to grow without oxygen okay and I've just picked up one question if you want to know what type of questions usually come uh, fungi are aerobes, some can grow under anaerobic conditions, few are anaerobes. But the important thing you have to keep in mind as a concept, and I'll keep on telling you the, some of the concept questions, anaerobes are not human pathogens. So anaerobes are not human pathogens. We usually have aerobes that are pathogens, okay? Also keep in mind in food industry, uh, fungi are very important. So most of the stuff that you normally eat, drink, and you, will, you cannot come up with any drink, any, anything that is bottled or packaged, and you look at it, uh, it produces, it's a citric acid, even ethanol, glycerol, they basically are coming from fungi. So fungi have a good uh, role in food industry because they produce primarily, citric acid is one of the things that's largely used in all the food products. And uh, secondarily, they also metabolize for us. They make antibiotics for us. We already know penicillin and then tons of other things. And there are some toxins as well, aflatoxins. If you remember your immunology, we talked about that. Uh, in terms of their growth, especially for ethanol, for example, production, they are relatively slow growing and their doubling times are hours rather than minutes. So that's, again... They really need a good time for the, for the growth. So that's one of the differences between the fungal metabolism. And that also gives you a negative connotation to that because many of them may cause chronic skin diseases, chronic infections, chronicity, insidiousness. You know, when we talked of uh, some of the microbes, we talk of some of the features that they have. Okay, so what I did was, and you can notice from the notes and you can also go to the book as well, I just picked up uh, only five. There, there are many more important fungi for, for medical purposes and don't get scared by the name of it. It looks like a French or Greek, but you'll get used to it once you uh, practice that. This is the most simple taxonomical list that we have, five major classes of fungi of medical importance. And we already discussed, and you can see all of them, easy to remember is, all of them end with mycetes. Mycetes, they all end with mycetes. So they are mycology, fungi, as simple as that. Zygote, Archaeasco, Basidio, Hemiasco, and Uasco. So these, these are some, there are quite a few mnemonics available as well. You can also try to come up with one. But these are the major mycetes classes that we normally discuss and teach for medical importance. How do they reproduce and again you can see we talked about the sexual reproduction which involves meiosis uh, where there is a fusion of protoplasm and the nuclei of two compatible mating types so this is the mating process or ace asexual which involves mitosis so meiosis and mitosis again important but uh, the five classes that i just told you they're produced by both sexual and asexual uh, the term that I'm going to use for some of the tests, the form of fungi that produce sexual spore is termed teleomorph, and the form producing asexual spore is an anamorph. So that's something that is, a, again, a concept-forming question. You can highlight it, color it, whatever you want to do. 
but this is an important fact that you need to remember. Uh, we need to isolate the fungi to test them. And uh, the most important thing that you have to keep in mind is that irrespective of the ability of the given fungi to form, to produce sexual spore, in most of the clinical situation, we see that they basically are referred to asexual designation. The, the problem is because when we isolate them from the clinical for the clinical specimen purposes, they basically at that form, at that stage are anamorphic, so asexual. And that's what we normally see uh, because then from asexual, we can convert them into sexual teleomorphic phase, especially if to provide them specialized conditions in the lab. As I said earlier, uh, fungi do cause human disease and of thousands and hundreds, uh, 200 are known for human disease, I will not teach you 200, but I think um, I would say maybe 20 at the most, but uh, one tenth of that. So these are important. And again, uh, for a pharmacist as well, I'm pretty sure uh, over the counter there are tons of drugs and there are some of them may not be prescribed. So they are all available. Everybody gets athlete food, everybody gets a rash, babies get diaper rash, nappy rash, this and that. So they all are fungi. And many a time people uh, don't, are not aware of that. So let's begin uh, for human diseases. So uh, mycetes, when they cause a problem, we call them mycosis. That's another term, keep in mind, mycosis. So we divide, I'm going to divide for this class, uh, mycosis. And again, uh, you can see the, these fungi have to enter and invade you. So the very first thing they're going to come in contact with, with your skin and mucous membrane. So they may cause problems on the superficial layer. We call superficial mycosis. They can go a little bit deeper, cutaneous mycosis. They go even more deeper, subcutaneous. So these are the three important in terms of skin. But once they go and invade in your tissues and go into the blood, we call endemic. And then finally, if they are your commensals, which they are, then they become opportunistic mycosis. And in clinical settings, you will see lot of pictures, lot of pictures. And I'm pretty sure people uh, out there are, those of you who are very, very careful for skin care, and there's a big industry for skin care, this is something that as a pharmacist, you need to know mycology. Because if you don't know mycology, you cannot provide a skin care, you cannot uh, prescribe something, you would not know what the mechanism of action is. And uh, most of the time, and I, I remember even our president Watson of the university in last uh, convocation, I believe, he was giving statistics because uh, CSU is a predominantly African-American community. And he was saying that, I don't know exact number, but he said that, uh, I'll just kind of come up with like 70, 80% of the money that goes for people to take care of either their skin, hair, and nail. So that's where even the students or population, you know, this is how much money goes over, which is a fact. And if you know it, R&D also people know it. So they know where the money is. So they're going to go and develop those skin lotions, colors, and because everybody wants a different skin. Everybody wants a different nail. Everybody wants a different hair. So we all are very, very kind of uh, touchy on that. And you in clinical practice, I'll just give you some of the examples. You can see nails, hair, and skin. And these are extreme forms. People will lose hair because of fungal infection. They can ball. People will use, lose the, uh, the shape of the nails uh, because of the fungi, color of the nails, athlete's foot, and so and so forth. OK? Now, as I said earlier, for pharmacists, this is what the concept is. I'm going to give you the problem with therapy. So therapy problem is, as we discussed earlier as well, they are eukaryotic, fungi are biochemically similar to human host. That's what our problem is. Thus, it is difficult to develop chemotherapeutic agents that will destroy the pathogen and not harm the patient. So that's basically an upshot of the therapy problems that we have. Now, uh, Many a time the classification is as I gave you by body location. We talk about cutaneous, subcutaneous, systemic. And uh, 
since this is the first lecture for mycology, I do intend to give you five lectures on mycology. So um, I'm just going to give you a broad picture today before I go into details. And you can see how do we diagnose. We look, at, take the scraping and look under the microscope and look for either yeast and mold and so on and so forth. We can also culture them. We have serological tests like antigen, antibody, and we can even have a DNA probes. So this is like a fast genetic test that we want to do uh, all the time. Uh, one commonest question you'll always see, most common culture uses Seborrhoid's agar. And what we do is that it has a low pH to inhibit bacterial growth. Uh, so we sometimes do add antibiotics. We, we want the fungi to grow and not the bacteria, right? And if you look at on the Seborrhoid's agar, this is how the fungi grow. So you can see the typical colorful nature of the growth of fungi. And these are like skin scrapings from people that may have some skin problems. 